going to mix up some slip, which is colored. I uh, use colored slip for a couple of different things. You could use colored slip for slip trailing if you wanted to put some, say, in a bulb syringe or a, a squeezy bottle. You could trail it. Or what I'm going to be using it for is coloring a clay body. Now, there are mason stains that are sold as a body color. Um, this is not one in particular. This is just um, a, a, a blue mason stain. It is uh, 6300. Um, I am going to be mixing it up in a Ziploc bag along with some slip. Now, this is just my throwing slip. You could use a prepared slip if you, say, have a blender or something. You could uh, prepare some slip. I'm going to scoop some of my slip into my Ziploc bag. There we go. And then I'm going to be adding some of my mason stain. Now, when you're dealing with dry mason stains, you have to treat it just like you would a, a glaze or a clay body. It's going to have microcrystalline silica. You don't want to breathe it in. Um, don't do it in a super drafty area like I turned my fan off here in my studio. And I'm going to be using a respirator when I mix this. Um, you just don't want to breathe in the dust. that I have the powder in the slip and the bag is closed, I can go ahead and remove my respirator. And this is the nice thing about using a Ziploc bag. I just kind of squeeze it and mix it up to get all that dry powder incorporated. I did not measure this at all. I uh, am just kind of winging it a little bit. If I wanted to intensify it, I could uh, always add a little bit more blue. I think I'll add just a little bit more. So because I'm going to be using this to stain a clay body rather than just using it as a slip, I did decide to add a little bit more of the blue stain to it because once I add it to my white clay body, it will end up by uh, becoming uh, quite a bit lighter. Okay. And that looks pretty, pretty well incorporated. Now that I have my stain incorporated into the slip, I'm now going to run it through a sieve. And this is a small talisman sieve. I just happen to be using an 80. Um, if I had a 60 on hand, I probably would have grabbed that. And I'm just using a rib to kind of encourage it, to kind of stir it and encourage it to go through the screen. So the sieve is going to incorporate any particles or lumps that might be not fully incorporated uh, as when I mixed it up in the bag. If you skip this step, I have found that you get little um, specks of color that aren't quite so incorporated into your clay body. So I like to really sieve this to get it uniform. Now at this point, there are different things that you can do to get this to a usable state if you're going to be coloring a clay body. Um, if I 
get it to a wedgeable state, that is the easiest way to incorporate it into clay. When it's um, just uh, slippy or pasty like this, sometimes you can wedge it in, but I will say that's very, very messy. And I'm not in that much of a hurry. So what I am going to do is I'm going to take some of my bone dry clay. These are just some pots that didn't work out at one point. And uh, as long as it's bone dry, it's going to incorporate the water. It's going to soak it up. And I'm just going to let those sit overnight. And when I come back tomorrow, these bone dry pieces should be soft. And uh, it should be able to be wedged. And then I'll have a very, very blue ball of clay that I can used to color a larger hunk. So it's more or less I'm just recycling the clay in a, in a blue slip at this point. So I'm just going to let this all sit and make sure that the clay is pretty much covered there, that it's under the, the liquid. And tomorrow I'll come back and this shouldn't be nearly as liquidy as it is now, and it'll be wedgeable. Okay, so this bag of clay has been sitting for a couple of days. This is the stain that I mixed with the very bone dry stuff, and I allowed it to absorb a lot of it. It is still a little on the wet side, as you can see. It's not exactly wedgeable in this condition, but I'm going to go ahead and try wedging it into some uh, clay that I already have right here. So the clay that I'm using is Laguna B-Mix. It's a mid-fire B-Mix. It's comb 5. Um, I use uh, the grog to B-Mix. Um, you can really stain uh, a bunch of different clays. I've really, I've only bothered ever staining uh, clays that are white or um, tan. Um, I don't know that, I don't think I would ever try to bother uh, staining like a red clay maybe, um, but some people might want to. So it's going to take a while to incorporate all this and I'm going to go ahead and just take a little bit of time and see what I can do here. Going to prep some balls of clay with um, the blue stain to create marbled clay. I already have some pre-measured uh, balls and I'm just going to take some of my stained clay and add uh, an amount to it, um, always less than half. Sometimes I would just do a quarter so I'm going to add just a little bit to these. And uh, keep in mind that the stained clay should be right around the same moisture as the unstained clay because you really want to make sure that you have a compatibility there of that moisture. If you have one that's way wetter than the other, you're going to have difficulties uh, with it throwing right um, and drying well. Okay, so now that I have the the stained part kind of stuck on there, I'm just going to wedge it in a few times. Okay, doesn't take that much. I usually do less than 10. 
set that aside, this little one. So you can see the spiral that the blue is definitely mixed in layers in there. In this one I actually put the blue in two different spots. And I'm going to, I kind of put the blue on the outside and then wedge it in. Okay, you can see the layers. And then last one. So the result of throwing something like this is that you end up with a piece with um, the layers of the stain and the layers of the unstained coming through. Now let's go over and we can talk about how we throw and reveal those layers. <laughs>